vocabulary lesson. What? Yeah, but that's my thing. Three years ago. Fine, whatever. Let's call that neutral. Holy insane opening. We are not in Brian Cranston's Godzilla. There are monsters and here they are. And these kaiju are fantastically rendered. Realistic, intimidating, and grotesque. We mourned our dead, memorialized the attack, and moved on. This is one of the first things this film did to be original. The first two minutes of the movie are what a whole lot of monster movies consist of. Setting up this mid-apocalypse monster future is pretty new. The world came together, pooling its resources. We created monsters of our own. Man, I hope this is what really happens if the situation arises. Really warms your heart to think about. Kaiju attacks could be the last reason to finally build Max. Yeah, humanity teaming up together would be cool too. Charlie Hunnam's workout routine. Cool name. Knife head. The delivery of that line. Knife head. He's fully aware of the live action anime he's living and it doesn't change how awesome it is. Based on this walk and this line, but we could hold our own in the fight. I'm now convinced that this is actually a sequel to Green Street Hooligans. Yep, that was Charlie Hunnam. You're welcome. Which means, uh, there's a post credit scene in that movie where Pete wakes up with amnesia in an American hospital. But only for his accent. He remembers all the fighting. Battle-worn suits, scuffed up metal, and scratched off paint gives a full visual history of Gypsy Danger. Pilot to pilot connection protocol sequence. So this is a future where the government appropriated GLaDOS, but have no fear that she'll eventually side with the kaiju? Oh well, at least there's cake. Rangers, this is Marshall Stacker Pentecost. The first name Stacker. Is it too early for a yup? Nah, yup. Each kaiju is pretty unique, but the glowing blue radioactive looking mouth is a great place to start. Saving the innocent. Everything about these battles nails the size and power these beasts are capable of. The whole neural handshake drift thing might seem like a random plot element to make this movie more interesting, but let's take picking up this boat for an example. If they can't feel the boat in the Jaeger's hand, it could slip out or they could apply too much pressure and crush it, etc. So they need tactile sensitivity to be effective. Arm pain is just another signal like touch to the peripheral nervous system from your central nervous system. So I can appreciate that to have control of an appendage with your brain like this, they would experience the pain of that appendage being severed. I'm not saying they shouldn't have some kind of failsafe, but it's early in Jaeger history and it makes sense in this universe. Too bad Yancey didn't steal his brother's four-leaf lover. What a merciless way to introduce our protagonist. All the sensation of losing a limb, feeling his own brother experience death, and then finishing off the kaiju alone under stress that would crush most people. Great framework for his character. This first real shot of scale is staggering. You guys died yesterday, working the top of the wall. I thought Coover fell to his death. Should have gone with a Piscatella joke? Nah. You know, the wall may be a dumb idea. It's supposed to be. But I appreciate the homage to the 1930s iron workers in Manhattan. There's no pretense, no shrouding in darkness. Here's a monster. Here's it being killed in full daylight looking amazing. We're not an army anymore, Mr. Beckett. We're the resistance. Which somehow makes you cooler. We've hit the breach before. It doesn't work. Nothing goes through. A little barcode foreshadowing. Numbers are as close as we get to the handwriting of God. <laughs> Charlie Kelly is the best. You take risks to endanger yourself and your crew. I don't think you're the right man for this mission. Painful honesty. You slow me down, I'm gonna drop you like a second kaiju. Setting up this secondary villain seems a little odd, but considering his arc and ending, it makes sense. Especially when you don't want to steal Stacker's spotlight. You get me? I'm a bit of a sucker for all things Japanese, so joystick fighting is always a win, right? Even if they are mixing a bunch of different disciplines. It's also an instance where this highly choreographed dance makes sense given that they're trying to establish compatibility. Not who's the better Joe fighter. Or I'm dead, in which case, ha, I also won. Sort of. Optimism? You look good. Compliments. Don't chase the rabbit. Random access brain impulse triggers. Ha! It's an acronym. Never realized. Just thought it was a Matrix reference. Is that impossible? It's impossible. Because... You know what? Why do you get to the guy? Little idiots! Idiots! One of the best sequences that drives the plot forward. Right from the smooth transition to the ash-snowing memory of Mako's backstory, we get a sense of calm before the storm that exudes real dread. Even knowing it's going to be some kind of kaiju and that Mako obviously survives the encounter, it's still one of the most beautifully frightening set pieces in the film. Also, the Lobster District 9 prawn kaiju Onibaba is one of the most unique. And Mana Ashida, the girl who plays young Mako, is fantastic. Rift sequence terminated. Would you like to try again? You'd like that, Gladys, wouldn't you? Anyone else get a bone village plus the slums equals the bone slums? If that's on purpose, I just started liking this movie a whole lot more. Either way, the fact that they built this city up around and incorporated the skeleton is a cool little detail that gives this war some age. No, 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 Blade came back and killed that guy. Two things. Good on Raleigh. for keeping his cool as long as he did. Chuck goads him, flicks him, but it isn't until he starts insulting Mako that he reacts. 
And I love that Raleigh makes quick work of him showing that Striker Eureka's success is due to being the latest and fastest generation Jaeger. Cause Jax can throw down. I mean, he barely connects a punch. Love it. And now we come back to the scene with a siren howling in the distance and the slowly building choral score. Good stuff. Come on, you can't watch that without smiling. One, don't you ever touch me again. Two, don't you ever touch me again. Brain bleed, radiation poisoning, drift psychosis aside, I'd listen to him. One of the ways the filmmakers keep us engaged is by maintaining reference points. For instance, Crimson Typhoon's head barely looks like a head, but then they shake it as if they've been jarred since the pilots were knocked down. Humanizes the Eggers a bit. The old T-1000 turn your body around sick move. First off, stereotypical Russian-ish sounding music blasting in when Cherno Alpha joins the fight. Second, every blow from Cherno feels heavy duty and barbaric. Everything about the way Cherno moves is rugged and more robotic, especially compared to Striker Eureka's fluid and sleek movements. Also, Robo Headlock. Well, not having to die from drowning is a win. I tried it once. Once. Did Hannibal just seriously reference Johnny Dangerously? Otachi makes the Mutos look like they were tiptoeing around. Not a whole lot of human perspective in this movie, but the little we do get does a great job of showcasing the panic. I love all the names in this movie. They're so awesome. One complaint on the list I feel like addressing is why did Leatherback only use the EMP pulse once? Well, because Gypsy ripped the EMP body part off. Let's do this together! The hot bender will load is too much. Oh, nose bleeding. Too mind blowing. Too much. Awesome. Elbow rocket. I think this guy's dead, but let's check for a pulse. learning from past mistakes. I wouldn't know whether to be terrified or mesmerized. Ooh, so pretty. Ship sword. Do I even need to explain? I want to point out the use of color and how it would have been really easy to gray everything down with a constant dark and rain. But Hong Kong is bright and vibrant and everything stands out captivatingly. All right, it's astonishingly ridiculous, but the blend of CG and practical is pretty amazing. As far as the reason for the shot other than fun, could be an acknowledgement of this film's disregard for Newtonian physical laws, or that Otachi is searching for Dr. Newton. Maybe both. Also, how about that skull and crossbones nuck tattoo? Talk about your cold shoulder. I mean, who saw that coming? The sword. The magnificent sword. Why didn't they use it earlier? This is why, because when it happened in theaters, we all just said, yeah, sword. But seriously, they're both super stressed out. Raleigh's focused on staying in alignment and he didn't know it had been added after the refit. Mako is a brand new pilot who's easily shaken and knows she needs to stay in the drift. When? The drift is silence. So she forgets they had it. Not good enough? How about this? It's been established that kaiju blood is poisonous, which is why they punch the kaiju a lot and use plasma and fire-based weapons to cauterize wounds. A sword would spread blood all over the city. So it's more of a last resort weapon. Still not good enough? How about because it would have gotten boring really quick? How it should have ended hit the nail on the head with setting up the Jaegers right by the breach. There's always an easier solution. It rarely makes for better entertainment. <laughs> Gypsy's alive. New friendships? Lines aren't fully formed. Umbilical cord tied around his neck. One look. That's all I needed. Perfect characterization of Hannibal. He was running away so fast he can barely get his inauthentic gloating out. And then he gets some deep blue sea karma. We're gonna own this bad boy. By Jove, we are going to own this thing for sure! <laughs> Cross-cultural relations? Back into that Jaeger, we'll kill you. Not getting into one will kill us all. Spock logic. Or Kirk logic, I guess, now, too. If I'm going to do this, I need you to protect me. Sweet moment with so much underneath. He's finally willing to let go and stop trying to protect her, while at the same time saying he has faith in her and believes in her talent. Today we face the monsters that are at our door! and bring the fight to them. Today we are canceling the apocalypse. All the poetry you want from a pre-battle speech accented by the cheesiest call to action that could only be delivered so expertly by Idris Elba. When you drift the summer, you feel like there's nothing to talk about. These two really put those words into facial expressions. Move, you fascists! <laughs> <laughs> we know Slattern is not as big as the Force Perspective shows, but what a great tool for conveying how formidable this Category 5 is. 
brutal. Helping your friend. Fun fact, actually, emotional fact. Mako says, sensei, which means I love you, sensei or teacher. A pretty important moment when you consider how reserved she's been and how she seems kind of ashamed of her emotions. Self sacrifice. These obvious nods to anime. Want to burn your assailant with your chest reactor? Just press the chest reactor button, and it's a great outside the box weapon. Reactor meltdown actually takes 60 seconds. Raleigh's alive! For a movie with a cliché checklist, I really appreciate that this relationship was built and teased but didn't go full Hollywood romance in the end. Their relationship is deeper than a finale kiss. From flirting, to some heartfelt conversation, to emotional seduction... Never really thought about the future. Until now. And then just a knowing head touch. Who saw this film's success coming? Not me. I remember seeing the trailer, being really excited, but in the back of my mind knowing that this would be the laughing stock of the box office and wondering why they didn't just call it Monsters vs. Robots. V-Robots. And man was I wrong. Maybe it's not the most cerebral story, but it is a story, with a pretty simple message and relatively developed, not completely stereotypical characters. The best thing it had has going for it is its originality. Except maybe Power Rangers, Godzilla, and some Evangelion. Personally, I didn't need to see anything more than the creator of Metal Gear, Hideo Kojima's praise about it. He even basically said you're not really Japanese if you don't go see it. And goodness was this action well executed. There was very little shaky cam, if any. At no point was I bored or waiting for a fight to be over. And each main fight had a hook that made it memorable. From waist-deep water to Hong Kong to deep underwater, every battle was engrossing and had its own physics and distinct feel. And the same can be said for the kaiju that Del Toro went to lengths to pull from the real world with textures and skin. And it wasn't all just smash and pummel to the point that you lose track of reality. They're constantly showing us the humans in close proximity to the Jaegers, reminding us of the scale. And there are some really well-composed shots. Raleigh is a great protagonist. He overcomes some serious hardships and proves himself worthy by being one of the two to ever run solo. Mako ended up being a very interesting character that I hope we get to see more of if she comes back for the sequel. And I have to praise not using her as a typical damsel trope. And I've loved Charlie Day since day one. I did it a little bit, yeah. But this was the first time he really impressed me with his range. And for a movie you'd assume would be totally focused on the fighting, they give the secondary characters plenty to do, even some plot developing information. But I don't think anyone felt like they got cheated out of the action. At its core, this movie is about people and communities of different backgrounds coming together to achieve a common goal. To quote Del Toro, we're all in the same robot. This film does a great job of bringing some diverse cultures together while maintaining said diversity. If nothing else, it's nice to see a well-received interpretation conglomeration of anime and giant monster movies. Jury's out on whether they can pull it off again. John Boyega has joined the cast for the sequel as Dr. Sun, so that's a good start. Sounds like no Jax Teller, though. So who's going to deliver these lines? Empty the clip! Empty the clip! Oh, <laughs> my